I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's July 6th, and we have a lot to talk about. Jean-Martin Charcot was born in Paris in 1825, and he's considered by many to be the father of modern neurology. In 1868, Professor Charcot made the very first diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. His clinical pathological definition of MS is still used today. And in 1882, Professor Charcot established the first neurology clinic in Europe at Salpetriere Hospital in Paris. Since 1969, the Charcot Award has acknowledged Professor Charcot's pioneering work by recognizing lifetime achievement in outstanding research into the understanding or treatment of MS. Once every two years, the MS International Federation announces the recipient of the Charcot Award, and my guest today is the newly announced recipient of this year's Charcot Award, Professor Alan Thompson. Over the course of his career, Professor Thompson has had a tremendous impact on so many areas of MS research and clinical care. If you've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, it's very likely that your neurologist relied on the diagnostic standard called the McDonald criteria in making your diagnosis. Professor Thompson has been a key contributor to the McDonald Diagnostic Criteria Committee since its formation in 2001. And he co-chaired the recent International Committee, which updated the diagnostic criteria for MS in 2018. But before we get to my conversation with Charcot Award recipient, Professor Alan Thompson, there are a few other things that you should know about. (music) Clinical trials take a very long time and therefore cost a tremendous amount of money. So from its inception, Shortening the length of progressive MS clinical trials has always been one of the clearly articulated goals of the International Progressive MS Alliance. And just a couple of weeks ago, the Alliance reached a milestone in achieving that goal when the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued a letter of support to the International Progressive MS Alliance, encouraging the exploration and development of further studies around a protein found in blood serum or plasma called neurofilament light chain as a potential rapid indicator of the value of an experimental therapy in early clinical trials involving people with progressive MS. We frequently discuss neurofilament light chain on past episode of Real Talk MS. It's a protein that's released into the spinal fluid and blood when those nerve wires called axons are damaged. And there are a number of studies that have been completed and others are underway to better define how neurofilament light chain might be used as a biomarker, an easy-to-measure indicator that could help detect and predict disease activity or response to treatments in MS and other disorders. This is the very first time that the FDA has provided a letter of support for further research for any MS-specific biomarker for use in clinical trials. And this letter will likely accelerate interest and further development by signaling to the pharmaceutical industry and academic researchers that the FDA, the organization that evaluates and qualifies clinical trial outcomes, is aware of the evidence supporting neurofilament light chain as a biomarker for detecting disease activity and determining response to MS treatments. The FDA's letter of support was issued in response to an application that included a review of published research results on neurofilament light chain that was compiled by the Progressive MS Alliance's Fluid Biomarkers Implementation Team a panel that includes experts from the pharmaceutical biotech industry, academic research, and people living with progressive MS. This same team had previously published a recommendation outlining evidence and priority research for developing neurofilament light chain as a biomarker for progressive MS. The Alliance has also submitted similar support materials to the European Medicines Agency, requesting a similar letter of support from them. 
This is an important step forward in changing the game when it comes to clinical trials for progressive MS. When, instead of waiting years for time-consuming, costly, and inconvenient MRI imaging to determine whether an experimental therapy has succeeded, a simple blood test will be able to accurately determine whether an experimental treatment for progressive MS might yield potential benefits. On a personal note, over the next couple of months, I'm wrapping up my six-year term as a member of the Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, and I couldn't be more grateful to my colleagues on the Fluid Biomarkers Implementation Team, nor more pleased to have been a member of the Scientific Steering Committee when this milestone was achieved. If you'd like to review the FDA's letter of support, you'll find a link in today's show notes. Today's disease-modifying therapies don't offer a cure for MS, and they don't really manage MS symptoms. Their most important function is to prevent long-term disability accumulation. And when you look at the disease-modifying therapies for relapsing remitting MS— you're looking at more than 20 different options that range from very mild therapies to more aggressive and effective therapies. The mild, moderate efficacy treatments are very safe, and the high efficacy treatments carry a greater risk associated with potential side effects. That's why it's so important for someone who's been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis to have a conversation with their neurologist or MS specialist where they can talk about potential risks and potential rewards and find out where, at what level of treatment, that person is going to be most comfortable. But the question that has gone unanswered is how do these different disease-modifying therapies with their different risk profiles actually perform when it comes to preventing that long-term disability accumulation? There are a number of important trials already underway that are designed to answer that question. But results from a study in Italy has provided us with perhaps an early answer. The research team analyzed data from just over 2,700 people living with relapsing remitting MS. All of the study participants began receiving treatment with a disease-modifying therapy within 13 months of the onset of MS. 365 of the study participants were given early, high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies, and the remaining 2,337 study participants were treated using what's called an escalation strategy, where each person is started on a very safe, moderately effective disease-modifying therapy, and they only escalate to a stronger therapy when the current therapy seems to no longer be working for them. The research team used statistical models to compare changes in disability over the course of 10 years, and the outcome of the study showed that those study participants who were treated early with high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies showed less disability over time. More research is needed here, and more research is taking place literally as we speak. But being able to make an evidence-based decision on whether the escalation treatment strategy or the early intensive treatment strategy is going to be best for someone who's been newly diagnosed with MS is going to change the treatment decision-making process for some neurologists. And it may even influence a level of risk tolerance that some people who have been newly diagnosed with MS are going to find acceptable. If you'd like to review the details of this study, You'll find a link in today's show notes. As we were just talking about high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies, it seems like the perfect time to mention that investigators are currently recruiting 156 people with relapsing MS at 19 sites across the United States for a clinical trial comparing autologous hematopoietic stem cell therapy or AHSCT, to those high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies. The study, called BEAT-MS, is the first clinical trial where the safety, efficacy, and cost-effectiveness of AHSCT 
will be directly compared to the best available pharmaceutical treatments that have demonstrated proven benefits to people living with active relapsing MS. The goal of autologous hematopoietic stem cell therapy is to reboot the immune system, which is the culprit responsible for damaging the brain and spinal cord in MS. And the theory is that the rebooted immune system is going to act right and no longer attack the central nervous system. In treating MS with AHSCT, blood cell producing or hematopoietic stem cells are harvested from a person's own bone marrow or blood. And a person's own cells are scientifically referred to as autologous cells. So these autologous hematopoietic stem cells are harvested and stored. And then using chemotherapy drugs, the patient's immune system is either completely or partially deleted. Then the stored stem cells are reintroduced into the patient where they migrate to the bone marrow and over time a brand new immune system is created. And it's been observed that the ability of this reconstituted immune system to attack the central nervous system is either greatly reduced or altogether eliminated, along with MS relapses. Study participants should be between the ages of 18 and 55, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and experiencing highly active treatment-resistant relapsing MS. And that's defined as two or more episodes of treatment failure in the prior 36 months while taking medication for MS. Everyone enrolled in the study will receive some form of treatment for their MS. If you'd like to learn more about the enrollment criteria for this study and check whether you're near one of the 19 sites enrolling study participants, please visit the study website at beat-ms.org. And you'll find a link to that website in today's show notes. I've heard from so many people living with MS that fatigue is the one MS symptom that can really get in the way of fully engaging in life. And the fact that it's one of those invisible symptoms of MS only makes things more frustrating. I don't think anyone dealing with MS-related fatigue needs to hear, gee, Maybe you need a nap from some well-meaning friend or family member. So if fatigue is getting in your way, you may want to know about this month's Can Do MS virtual programs because they're all about staying energized. The first program kicks off tomorrow with a webinar titled, Why Am I So Tired? Fatigue and Other Invisible MS Symptoms. On July 10th, There's a jumpstart program about managing sleep and fatigue and MS. There's a coaching session about optimizing your energy on July 14th. On July 22nd, there's a jumpstart program focused on managing temperature sensitivity, pain, and vision problems. And on July 27th, there's a coaching session on overcoming setbacks. All of the Can Do MS programs are available to you at no charge, and you can participate from the comfort and safety of your own home. The Can Do MS workshops and coaching sessions can make a real difference in your overall well-being and quality of life. And if you'd like to learn more or register to participate, you can visit cando-ms.org slash programs, and you'll find that link in today's show notes. When it comes to making a real difference in the lives of people affected by MS, and perhaps especially making a difference in the lives of people affected by progressive MS, the very first name that comes to my mind is today's guest, Professor Alan Thompson. If I took the time to even read you a list of Professor Thompson's major accomplishments in MS research, just his major accomplishments, I promise The list would go on for so long that you'd get tired of the sound of my voice. Instead, I'll just say that in a moment, we'll meet my guest, this year's recipient of the Charcot Award, Professor Alan Thompson. Every two years, the MS International Federation awards the Charcot Award, recognizing lifetime achievement in outstanding research into the understanding and treatment of multiple sclerosis. 
This year, the recipient of the Charcot Award is Professor Alan Thompson. Professor Thompson is the Dean of the Faculty of Brain Sciences at University College London, Pro Vice Provost for London at University College London, the Garfield Weston Professor of Clinical Neurology and Neurorehabilitation at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology, and among his many other responsibilities, the Chair of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. Over the course of his career, Professor Thompson has had a a tremendous impact on so many areas of MS research and clinical care. If I tried listing all of his major achievements, we actually wouldn't have any time left for our conversation. Professor Thompson has led, served on, and founded numerous national and international scientific and funding boards and committees. He's served as a mentor to several noted MS specialists, and he's been a strong advocate for including and amplifying the voice of people affected by MS on a global scale. If you've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, it's very likely that your neurologist relied on the diagnostic standard called the McDonald Criteria in making your diagnosis. Professor Thompson has been a key contributor to the McDonald Diagnostic Criteria Committee since its formation in 2001, and he co-chaired the recent International Committee, which updated the Diagnostic Criteria for MS in 2018. Professor Thompson, congratulations on being honored for what is truly a remarkable body of work, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for that, and it's a pleasure to be here. What was it that first interested you in focusing on multiple sclerosis? Well, so now you're going back a number of uh, many decades, and and in fact, what many people don't know is that I initially thought I might do law and not do medicine at all. I wanted to do something interesting in life. That was the only thing I thought. At least your career needed to be interesting. So when I went into medicine and and looked looked at the various areas, uh, psychiatry was the one that I initially thought about. But then I didn't feel I could contribute very much there, so I went into neurology, and. I don't know. I, I just felt that the MS seemed to be an area that wasn't making much progress. And when you're young, you're you're both uh, ambitious and incredibly naive. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe this is an area I could actually do something. It can't be that difficult. Uh, surely we can we can do something to to move things on, to understand it better, so that we could we could treat it. Because remember, uh, when I was starting, MS was an untreatable condition. Something many people couldn't contemplate now. And much of that work, the initial work on some of the very first disease-modifying therapies was something that you were very involved in. Yeah, I was I was very involved. I mean, it, you know, again, going back several decades, um, we, we tended to work separately across the, the globe, And uh, but I was involved in a number of European initiatives uh, looking at the interferons and looking actually at primary progressive MS. I did the first study, first trial in primary progressive MS, a small trial, but nonetheless, uh, the beginning, uh, and that's going back over 20 years now. Well, we can fast forward to where we are today. Speaking of primary progressive MS, you're in the midst of your final year serving as the founding chair of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. And I guess in the interest of full disclosure, I should probably mention that I'm also in the final months of my term as a member of the Scientific (laughs) Steering Committee, where it's been both an honor and privilege to represent the perspectives of people affected by progressive MS. And frankly, it's been an equal honor and pleasure getting to know you over the past six years. So I thought we should talk a bit about progressive MS. And and I guess a good place to start is asking you why progressive MS has proven to be so challenging to understand Uh, from, from a research or even a clinical perspective. What makes it so much more difficult than relapsing remitting MS? Uh, well, John, before I start, I should say it's been a great pleasure getting to know you as well over, over these last six years. Um, when I came to London in 1985 and uh, I began working with Ian MacDonald, who was what, one of my mentors after Michael Hutchinson, I asked him what area of MS I, I should focus on. And he, he immediately said, progressive MS because it's that will be the most challenging. It, it, it is the most complex. And I think in very simple terms, the, the reason why it's so complicated is because we don't 
actually understand what makes progressive MS, progressive MS, what, what the underlying mechanisms of progression truly are. And, and if you don't understand mechanisms, it's really difficult to target treatments effectively. So with relapsing or remitting MS, we have much greater understanding of the, of the inflammatory nature of the condition. So we now have a range of treatments which, which directly and very effectively uh, deal with that inflammation. But what they don't do, at least not to a, a great extent, is target the underlying uh, progression, the underlying neurodegeneration, which then leads to uh, long-term disability. So I, I think it's as simple or as complicated as that. When you consider what the Alliance has been able to accomplish in a relatively short period of time, what stands out to you? Well, what are you most proud of? Well, I remember when this was discussed initially, I think it was with Tim Kutsi, I thinking, well, I'm not sure what we can achieve with this kind of initiative. It's also difficult. And can we really get people to work together and focus on it? Uh, and we did. But I, I also said then, well, at least if we raise the profile of progressive MS, at least if you make people aware that it's a problem, that it's something we really have to pay attention to, that would in itself be an achievement. So I suppose I would say two things. I, I would say, first of all, we have certainly raised the profile. Now, there are a lot of other things that have happened at the same time, which have helped that. But we have raised the profile. People in the MS community around the world realize that progressive MS is a major issue and one that warrants attention and focus and investment of time and energy. The second, though, is we, we need everybody to focus on this. By everybody, I, I mean uh, globally, everybody, but also all sectors. So the obviously the, the researchers and the clinicians, people affected by MS, our colleagues in, in industry, uh, government, uh, legislators. We, we need everybody to focus on this and we need to work together to try and move it forward. So, you know, we always talk about the importance of collaboration. It's a really difficult thing to achieve. So that would be the second thing I'd be most proud of is the, the way in which we have been able to bring everybody together quite willingly because it Everybody understands this is something we need to try and sort, but bringing everybody together to try and move move the field forward, that, that would be the second thing I feel very pleased that we've been able to do. The International Progressive MS Alliance has recently announced that it's investing just over 1.4 million euro in funding 19 Research Challenge Awards. What can you tell us about the Alliance's Challenges in Progressive MS Awards? So I think this goes back to the original point I made when, when we were thinking we've done a number of things within the alliance in terms of the international networks uh, and other, other initiatives. But when we regrouped uh, it, during these particularly difficult and challenging times and asked the question, what's the most important thing we need to focus on? It again came back to understanding mechanisms. So these challenge awards were really encouraging our research colleagues to think about new areas of research activity that might then lead us on to a new discovery a new understanding of of the underlying mechanisms and and, and this and it was quite broad it looked at a number of different areas and it was particularly trying to attract people that perhaps hadn't worked in the field before or maybe had, but to a, to a lesser degree. And uh, so again, as we've been trying to do, attracting more people to the field and getting more ideas uh, in the hope that we will get some new insights into mechanisms as we've done previously. Uh, and I have to say, and I, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm going on a bit, but when you look at the range of really exciting awards that we've made, they cover all aspects of, of underlying mechanisms. So I think it's been at least at, to this stage, a great success. Of course, we won't know until we actually see the uh, what comes from the work. But in terms of attracting people, it's been great. You were instrumental in using MRI as part of the criteria to diagnose MS. Uh, since your initial work, we've not only seen improvements in MRI technology itself, but also in fields like artificial intelligence. In fact, you were part of a team that successfully leveraged machine learning and imaging to identify new subtypes of multiple sclerosis. Where or, or how do you see artificial intelligence impacting MS diagnosis and treatment in the near-term future? Artificial intelligence is a really powerful and very topical tool. But like all tools, and I'd include MRI in this, 
It's only as good as the questions you pose to it and the ways in which you use it. So I think that uh, with, with, with MRI, I, I was able to, we were able to apply it to understand mechanisms, particularly in the spinal cord. We were able to use it to help with diagnosis and with treatment trials. But it had to be focused, and you had to be clear about the question you, you are asking. Um, artificial intelligence, which, which we used uh, at Queen Square, but in collaboration with Doug Arnold's work in, in Montreal, a work funded by the Progressive MS Alliance, um, it w- was able to use huge data sets to pick out, identify patterns of MRI activity in a way which you could never have thought possible in the past. I mean, diverse, uh, complex data sets that were, if amalgamated, could then be actually interrogated. So trying to get a sense of what's happening to groups of patients uh, uh, according to the pattern of change on MRI is 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 really exciting area. It's very exploratory. So I, I would be cautious about over-interpreting the results, even though it's our own our own work. I think it it did show that there were different patterns. What we need to now work out is what that actually means. Because I, I, I'm kind of moving on, on to a slightly different topic, but one of the challenges we have in MS is how we describe patients, how we describe the, the descriptors we use. Uh, and the, currently, the descriptors we use are very clinical, which is okay, but it doesn't tell you about underlying pathology and underlying mechanisms. If we could make uh, these descriptors more sophisticated by incorporating data through artificial intelligence around patterns of behavior in MRI, we may get a much more pathologically specific descriptor. And the benefit of that would be that we could predict how patients may respond to treatment. So this concept of personalized medicine, AI has a great part to play in trying to classify an individual in a way that improves their treatment. And and that, to me, is the great goal, really, of, of any of these approaches. Since you mentioned personalized medicine, and, and I've heard you mention it before, I've heard, I've heard you say that we're getting closer to being able to practice personalized precision medicine. Can you just give us a quick explanation of, of what that means and, and how it benefits someone who could be diagnosed with MS? Right treatment for the right patient at the right time. So whether you use the term personalized or precision, um, th- 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 there is an overlap. Uh, but what, what you're talking about is a specificity so that you see a patient, you take their history, you examine them, but then you do a range of other investigations. And from all that data, which you then put into a black box, you get a sense of or get a get a clear uh, signal as to what treatment might benefit them most. You know, at the moment, we have discussions around treatments uh, where we think, well, should we start with mildly effective treatments and work up, escalate up, or should we actually go right in with very, very uh, effective but but powerful and therefore have treatments with strong side effects? Which should we do? And the answer probably is we have to do a variety across it. There's no straight answer, but we have to look at the patient and the patient's characteristics and let that guide our choice for first treatment and then subsequent treatments. So that that to me is what I, I quite like the term personalized because it's talking about the person, the individual. You also serve as the chair of the International Advisory Committee on Clinical Trials in Multiple Sclerosis. And there's a groundbreaking clinical trial called Octopus that will be getting underway in the UK later this year. Can you tell us what this trial is about and what it is about the trial design that makes it so unique and actually gives the trial its very, um, its very memorable name? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yes. So, I'm, I'm not going to discuss how many arms or legs an octopus has because that was a topic of conversation we had at one of our first meetings, and it was difficult to get a consensus. But the the concept of multi arm uh, and and multi stage uh, trials is what underpins uh, octopus, uh, and it's come really from. Uh, cancer trial design, particularly uh, the, the notable one is a trial called Stampede, which was for prostate cancer, where you were able to 
put a number of uh, drugs in, into the mix and assess them over a period of time against a control group. But then, and those that were doing well were carried on. And then you could add further drugs over time. So this is, this is really, a, it's like a living uh, trial. Uh, and you, you, you may end up with pairing approaches or single agent. But it, it's really to move us away from one drug against a control arm, which takes three or four years before you get a result, often negative, and then you start again, and you lose five or six years each time. With, with, with these, uh, this approach, you have shorter trials, and you have multiple arms. And Jeremy Chataway, who is really the great champion of this adaptive trial design, uh, has been leading for this. And we have done one such trial uh, in, in progressive MS, uh, which unfortunately was negative, but demonstrated that we were, that the MS community, and by community, I just, I mean, people with affected by MS, but also the clinicians and the trialists were comfortable with, with using this much more exciting dynamic trial design, which in the end will get us answers more quickly. And that's particularly important with progressive MS, where there's real difficulties with the duration of trials if you're, if you're looking for effect. Professor Alan Thompson, the Charcot Award recognizes lifetime achievement. When it comes to making a difference in both the clinical treatment and the scientific exploration of multiple sclerosis, I'd suggest you have a lifetime of many significant achievements. Thank you for all that you continue to do to improve the lives of people affected by MS, and thanks for talking with me today. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 201. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into your email or text. If you haven't yet done so, please don't forget to visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the easiest way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes, and it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. So I hope you'll take a moment and download the app today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.